Team Avatar meets an enigmatic, charismatic leader named Jet. Katara falls for him as she has fallen for no one ever before, and then she's deeply, painfully betrayed by him. This is episode 110, Jet. Part 1, Synopsis. Team Avatar is lost. They decide not to fly because Sokka says it'll get them captured by the Fire Nation. This sounds reasonable, but they follow Sokka, who proclaims himself the leader, and they get into trouble very quickly. They're surrounded by Fire Nation soldiers because they just happen to walk into a Fire Nation camp. Thankfully, they're saved by Jet, this mysterious leader of a group of Freedom Fighters. The Freedom Fighters defeat the Fire Nation, and give Team Avatar a tour of their treehouse hideout. Their goal is a lot like the goal of Team Avatar, to defeat the Fire Nation. However, it's very personal for Jet, and he wants to make them hurt. He wants revenge. Like Katara, he lost his family, and he wants to get them back for that, and he's willing to do whatever it takes to get there. Sokka's the first to be skeptical of Jet. He implores Team Avatar to get out of there, but they just call him jealous, and to a certain extent he is, but he's also right about Jet. Jet is very smooth. He knows exactly what to say to people. He knows exactly what will convince them. When Sokka turns against him, he tries to play to Sokka's ego, portraying Sokka in the most positive light possible. But Sokka isn't fooled. He stands by his morals and his virtues, and he stays opposed to Jet. Katara, in part because she's in love with him, and in part because her dark side has a lot in common with who Jet is, falls for his ideas and his commitment, and she really believes in his idealism. And when he sends them on a plan, she and Aang wholeheartedly believe in it. However, it's only later that they realize that his plan is to flood the entire town. Yes, getting rid of the Fire Nation, but also causing a lot of civilian casualties. Once Aang and Katara discover they've been fooled, they try to fight against Jet, but he manages to give the signal to blow up the town. And it's up to Sokka to save the people of the town. And in the end, it's Sokka's instincts, which have been roundly criticized throughout the episode, that save the day, and stop the people of the town from being killed by Jet's extremism. Jet calls him a traitor, but... Sokka turns that back on him and says that he's the traitor because he stopped protecting innocent lives and just gave in to a rampage of revenge. It's a very smart, very nuanced episode, and I really appreciate that. It challenges these characters and really proves what they're made of because of that, forces them to consider what they really do believe, and how exactly they contrast with Jet. Part 2 Analysis. First thing I'd like to say before I forget to say it, this episode looks fantastic. The visual aesthetic is as compelling and charming as it is ever in the course of Avatar The Last Airbender. And that is saying something, because this is a beautiful show. It may not be as high definition as a lot of shows nowadays, but so what? It's gorgeous. The imagination put into crafting these aesthetics is remarkable, and that's never more true than right here. It's very autumnal, perhaps appropriate considering the somber, sobering nature of this episode and how it forces mostly Katara and Aang to confront their own faults and how they've been tricked by Jet and the words he says, all his idealism. But it's hard to even contemplate the resonance on a thematic level because it's just so mind-blowing on a purely visual level. I've always loved this idea of a wild autumn, not just a few trees lined along the road, but a forest turning orange and red and all these lovely, gorgeous colors. And this episode delivers on that in a very stylish, stylized way. Even if you don't like the autumnal aesthetic as much as I do, you have to appreciate how the show is willing to experiment and go beyond what it's shown before. It doesn't just stick with the same few color palettes, the same few ideas aesthetically. It's not afraid to expand. It's, it's not afraid to show off. It's not afraid to innovate. It's not afraid to be inventive. And I really think that reflects why the show is so great narratively, while also being important on its own right. 
How an animated show looks is incredibly important. That may sound like a shallow thing to say, but I don't think it is. In animation, more than in other types of film and television, you have control over how the art looks. It's a product of your imagination, of your creativity. So, yeah, I do think that the fact that this episode is completely beautiful is a major point in its favor. I always think of this as a Katara episode, so I'm always surprised when I rewatch it, and I realize that it's just as much a Sokka episode. Sure, it's Katara who has to learn and grow, and it's Katara who gets absolutely furious at Jet and wreaks her wrath upon him by the end of the episode, but it is Sokka who gets to demonstrate that despite his goofiness and his corniness and his many, many flaws, he is a good and moral person who has value to the group. Yes, he's the kind of person who always wants to be the leader and is kind of arrogant and thoughtless sometimes, but hidden beneath that there's a real sense of depth and maturity. He's aware. He's a person who has a very distinct grasp on his surroundings, and that benefits him quite often. He sees right through Jet's cool, he sees right through Jet's charisma, he knows there's more to it than that. We have to admit that there is a part of him that is jealous of Jet, and that's the reason why he's more skeptical of him than he should be, but he's not willing to give Jet a pass, even when Jet turns on the charm. Jet tries to paint Sokka as this hero who saves him from a lethal threat in terms of that Fire Nation old man, but Sokka is quick to point out that the old man was not a danger, that the only real danger comes from Jet himself, who has given in to extremism, who has allowed his passion and his hatred to consume him and stop him from thinking more logically and rationally and really understanding that, no, it's not worthwhile to kill all these people just to get rid of the Fire Nation. What I love about Jet as a character is how earnest he is. He's not a huckster, he's not a con man, He's not trying to deceive people, he just has very strong and passionate extremist beliefs. Is this wrong? Yes, that's what the show argues and I would mostly agree with that. But it also understands that he's not a villain in the simple way. He's not Ozai, he's not Zhao, he's not season 1 Zuko. He genuinely believes in what he's doing, and what he's doing is not wrong necessarily. It only becomes wrong because he doesn't take it in moderation. He's willing to do whatever it takes, no matter the loss of life, no matter the sacrifices. And what I also like about how they portray Jet's character is that his charisma is believable. So many times in lesser shows, they try to have a charismatic leader, but the leader's not actually charismatic. The leader's just kind of goofy and obviously evil. Jet's different. The dynamic between his group is very believable and very real, and there's real heart and soul to it. These aren't a bunch of cruel-hearted people. They're a bunch of earnest, passionate people who have perhaps been misled and are so hurt that they're willing to do anything it takes to get rid of the Fire Nation, even something that costs a lot of lives. And that dynamic forms because Jet is such an inspiring leader. He's genuinely dynamic. He's electrifying, and a part of me respects him for that, even though I am more than willing to admit that his philosophy is not the best. And that's what the show is trying to convey. That's the reaction it's trying to evoke. It's not just, look at this guy, he's bad, don't you see? It's not moralistic like that, it's very empathetic. It really shows you why people believe in Jet also showing why he's wrong. And this is important for Sokka. There is a difference between him and Jet, and it shows here. Before this episode, Sokka has always been very rah-rah, defeat the Fire Nation at all costs. He makes a lot of very caustic and dehumanizing remarks about the Fire Nation. This is understandable, considering what they've done to him and his people, but it's also a little troublesome. This episode, however, shows him taking a stand and saying, no, it's not worth doing everything you can to defeat the Fire Nation. There are things more important. Protecting the lives of people is more important. Yes, the Fire Nation is evil, but why are they evil? They're evil because they're causing so much harm and misery and suffering to innocents. If we want to beat them, we have to be better. 
We can't just go around destroying them at whatever cost. We need to protect the lives of the vulnerable and disenfranchised. It's an important moment for Sokka's character, and it shows him to be much more complicated than what we've seen him be in the past, much more morally nuanced. Part 3. Context Now before we go on, we have to admit the similarities between Zuko and Jet. It makes sense that they meet in Season 2. It's not just a writing trick, a writing contrivance, to throw two characters into the same space and see how they interact. There's real thematic resonance to having them meet because they do have so much in common. They've both been hurt by the Fire Nation. They both have a real dark side. They're very passionate, and that passion can warp them into extremism. It can warp them into doing whatever they think needs to be done to achieve their goal, even though it causes a lot of misery and suffering. The similarities between them are also established by having Katara fall for both of them. And yes, I do consider that moment in Old Bossing Say in episode 220, Katara falling for Zuko. At least for that one moment, there is a romantic sort of connection between them. And Katara is attracted to them for the same reasons. They're hurt, and they're vulnerable, and they're passionate about it. They're willing to do something. And that allows her to overlook their dark sides, because their dark sides are a lot like her dark side. It's not pure evil, it's willing to do what's ever necessary to get back what I've lost, or to at least make it feel a little less bad, a little more alright. She really understands that because she's lived it, and that's a major reason why she falls for both of them. Shifting topic, since this episode is so much about Sokka, Let's talk about him and how he grows as a leader. When he proclaims himself the leader in this episode, it's treated kind of like a joke, at least by Katara. And she is right to an extent. He's not a leader at this point, at least not in the sense that he thinks he is. Ever since he was left there at the Southern Water Tribe while the men went out to fight, he thought of himself as the leader, the warrior, the person who has to help everyone. But in reality, it's Katara who's the one who keeps the group together at this point. She's the leader, if anyone is. And of course, that's what makes it interesting that she's the only one in this episode who's not mentioned as possibly being the leader of the group. When Sokka asks her who she thinks the leader is, she says Aang, because he's the Avatar. However, over the course of the show, Sokka does grow into a great leader. Yes, he fumbles that speech before the Battle of the Eclipse, but he did come up with that plan, and it's a really clever and well-thought-out plan that, by all accounts, should have worked. <laughs> but more than that, Sokka's growth as a leader can be seen in how he leads the group during the Eclipse. When Hakoda's hurt, Sokka is right there to step in and take up the charge. He does this without hesitation, and he does it well, and he handles himself as best he could. This is why it makes sense that he becomes such a high-ranking official in The Legend of Korra. Of the main members of Team Avatar, he is the one who does fit the idea of a conventional leader. He is the one who can rally the troops and bring everyone together. He may not be as good at stopping everyone from falling apart as Katara is, but he still has charisma, he still has talent, he's still a very smart and dedicated person. He's an even-minded, level-headed leader by the time we see him in Korra, and that marks a significant departure from the very pretentious, arrogant kid we see at the start of the show. And, of course, there are episodes that mark that evolution, and this is one of them. He's still not a great leader, but he proves himself unwilling to be fooled. He stands on his own. He makes his own path. And no, he's not perfect. There's that crack about his instincts at the end of the episode, when he leads them in the wrong direction. But he is becoming a much better leader than we see earlier on. So there you have it, we're at the halfway point in Season 1. It's been quite a ride, and what an episode to reach this point on. Jet is one of my favorite episodes of these first ten. It does a great job at demonstrating the thematic maturity of the show. It can handle complicated themes in a complicated and nuanced way without ever feeling preachy, without ever feeling like an after-school special. 
It can be very poignant and mature when it needs to be, but it can also be very light and effervescent and exhilarating. There are some beautiful vistas coming up, such as the Northern Water Tribe that we see near the end of Season 1, one of my all-time favorite locations in the show. There is the Siwang Desert in all its desolate, gorgeous bleakness. It's harrowing, but it's also gorgeous in a way. And there's the Fire Nation Palace itself, which is kind of the same way. Its beauty is not contrasted with its menacing qualities so much as it is a result of those menacing qualities. It's awe-inspiring, but it's also a little dread-inspiring, and that's interesting. I hope you really enjoyed this one. I love talking about Jed. It's one of the most important episodes of the show in really defining what the show looks like going forward. And it is proof of something I always say, that Katara episodes, and again, I do see this as a Katara episode, are very intense and denser than the average episode, because they force Katara to be introspective. They force her to look within herself and measure her strengths against her flaws, and see how she can improve and be better. This is as opposed to Aang episodes, which criticize him to an extent, but they're never as willing to criticize him as Katara episodes are to criticize her. So I hope you liked what you saw today. Like, donate, subscribe if you want to see more. Keep watching Avatar, and I hope you tune in for the next Avatar Explained video. Thank you. Adios, comrades.